Wastewater reuse has become much more commonplace in recent years, and there are now many examples from all around the world of crops being successfully irrigated with treated wastewater. My own view is that wastewater is simply too valuable to waste. Many farmers in both industrialised and developing countries know this, and they use wastewater to water and fertilise their crops, or to fertilise their fish ponds. Wastewater reuse in this way has tremendous advantages, higher crop yields, for example, and reduced river pollution. But there can be dangers to public health if the wastewater is not properly treated before it's reused. This young boy is working in a field irrigated with untreated wastewater, and because he's not wearing any shoes, he is at risk, especially from hookworm infection. In the past few years, the World Health Organization and other international agencies have examined in detail the health risks of wastewater reuse. The main risk in the use of wastewater for crop irrigation is infection with intestinal worms, especially the intestinal nematodes, for example, Ascaris lumbricoides, the human roundworm. The adult worms are about the size of a pencil, and mature females can produce some 200,000 eggs a day. The human hookworms are also important, as is Trichuris trichiura, the human whipworm. The World Health Organization has recommended that only treated wastewater should be used for crop irrigation, and there are several low-cost and highly efficient methods available for wastewater treatment, such as waste stabilization ponds. These ponds are in Kenya, and they produce a high-quality effluent very suitable for crop irrigation. For all crops, the treated wastewater should contain no more than one intestinal nematode egg per litre. This applies to industrial crops, such as cotton, as well as to vegetables and salad crops. And this is to protect both the field workers and the crop consumers from infection with these intestinal worms. WHO also recommends that for crops for direct human consumption, including those eaten uncooked, such as salad crops, the treated wastewater shouldn't contain more than 1,000 faecal coliform bacteria per 100 millilitres. And this is to protect the crop consumers from bacterial diseases such as cholera and typhoid fever. So here is a summary of the World Health Organization's current recommendations. For restricted irrigation, and this means the irrigation of crops which are not for direct human consumption, such as cotton or wheat or sunflowers, no more than one intestinal nematode egg per litre. For unrestricted irrigation, which covers crops for direct human consumption, including those eaten raw, the same nematode guideline, and also no more than 1,000 faecal coliform bacteria per 100 mil. But how do you count such numbers, one egg per litre and 1,000 faecal coliforms per 100 mil? Here at the University of Leeds, we have done a considerable amount of work on how to count very low numbers of helminth eggs. And Dr. Rebecca Stott is now going to show you how to count the number of eggs in a sample of treated wastewater. We use the modified Bailinger method to count helminth eggs in wastewater because we find it to be one of the best methods. We start by collecting a large volume of at least 10 litres of treated wastewater because the number of eggs is likely to be low. A bucket can be used as shown here, but any straight sided container will do. We leave the samples to sediment for a couple of hours before removing about 90% of the supernatant. A siphon or suction pump can be used for this, whichever is convenient. When removing the supernatant, make sure that none of the sediment is removed by mistake. We then transfer the sediment from the bucket to a one litre beaker. To ensure that all the sediment is transferred, we rinse the sides of the bucket carefully with dilute detergent solution. We add all of the washings to the litre beaker.
We leave the sample to settle again for a couple of hours before removing the supernatant. A pipette tip can be attached to the suction pump to remove the supernatant very carefully without disturbing the sediment. The sediment can now be transferred to centrifuge tubes. The number used will depend on the volume of sediment. We are using 50 mil tubes to start with. Balance the tubes by equalizing the volume in each tube. We centrifuge the tubes for 15 minutes at 1000 G, relative centrifugal force. For this benchtop centrifuge, 1000 G is about 3200 revs per minute, but the speed will vary depending on the centrifuge. After centrifuging, the eggs will be in the pellet at the bottom of the tube. Again, we remove the supernatant from the tubes. If there is any wastewater sample left in the litre beaker, we add this to the tubes. We rinse the container again thoroughly with detergent and these washings are also added to the tubes. We centrifuge these tubes again for 15 minutes and remove the supernatant. We then transfer the sediment to smaller graduated tubes. Remember to rinse the tubes and transfer the washings as well. Centrifuge these tubes for 15 minutes. Meanwhile, any equipment that's been in contact with the wastewater should be set aside for autoclaving. After centrifuging the tubes, remove the supernatant as before. All the sediment can now be transferred to one tube. We centrifuge this tube again for 15 minutes and end up with a single pellet from the 10 litres of treated wastewater. We remove the supernatant and record the volume of the pellet after centrifugation. For the next stage of the method, we carry out an extraction. We suspend the pellet in an equal volume of acetoacetic buffer. If the pellet is less than 2 mils, as it is here, we add buffer up to 4 mils. This will allow the supernatant to be poured off without disturbing the pellet, as we'll see later.
We now add two volumes of ethyl acetate. So, in this case, we add 4 mils, making the total volume up to 8 mils. Sealing the tube with some parafilm, we then mix the contents of the tube thoroughly by hand. A vortex mixer could also be used for this. We then balance the tubes and centrifuge at 1000 G for 15 minutes. The sample has now separated into three distinct phases. The bottom layer contains the helminth eggs and other heavy non-fatty debris and we record the volume of this pellet. The clear middle layer is the buffer. The top layer is the ethyl acetate and it contains fatty and other material which forms a dark plug. We need to gently loosen this top layer so that we can pour off the supernatant in one smooth action. We resuspend the pellet in five volumes of zinc sulfate solution. For this sample, the volume of the pellet is 0.2 mils, and so we add 1 mil of zinc sulfate. We record the total volume of the pellet and zinc sulfate as 1.2 mils. We now mix the tube thoroughly. Using a pasta pipette, we remove an aliquot and transfer this to a McMaster slide. This is a new single chamber slide. The old slides have two chambers. When adding the sample, try to avoid any air bubbles under the grid. When the chamber is full, the volume under the etched grid is 0.15 mils. We leave the slide to stand for about five minutes before placing it under a microscope. This allows the eggs to float to the surface and lie under the grid. Focus the microscope on the etched lines of the grid. Only count the eggs that are inside the grid area. For accuracy, we usually examine several slides and record a mean value. In treated wastewater, we're looking for eggs of Ascaris lumbricoides, Trichuris trichura, and hookworm eggs. Search the grid up and down carefully. This is an Ascaris egg, and we count it because it is inside the grid area. This is the edge of the grid. This Trichuris egg is not counted because it is outside the grid area. We record the volume of sample we examined in the McMaster slide. In our single chamber slide, we looked at one grid, so the volume is 0.15 mils. We also record the number of eggs we counted within the grid, or the mean value, if we examined more than one grid. We then calculate n the number of eggs per litre by multiplying the number of eggs we counted in the slide by the volume of the final product and divide our answer by the volume we examined in the McMaster slide multiplied by the volume of the original sample in litres. The answer is 0 0.8 intestinal nematode eggs which is within the WHO guidelines so this treated wastewater is safe to use for restricted irrigation. Now we are going to move on to counting faecal coliform bacteria. There are several standard laboratory techniques to do this, but we are going to show you a very simple method which is especially suitable for the routine monitoring of treated wastewaters. One of our public health engineering technicians, Karen Abbas, will now show you how to do this. When we're doing the bacteriological examination of a treated wastewater, or any water for that matter, we have to ensure that we don't accidentally contaminate the sample while we're doing the analysis. 
So we start off by sterilizing the laboratory apparatus in an autoclave or pressure cooker for 15 minutes at 121 degrees C. And then we adopt special aseptic analysis procedures. The first thing we do is sterilize a suitable container. We then collect a sample of the effluent and bring it to the laboratory, keeping it as cool as possible in transit. When we open the sample bottle, we quickly pass the neck of the bottle through a flame. This is part of the aseptic procedures. Using a sterile pipette, we draw off one mil of sample and transfer to a sterile McCartney bottle or test tube which contains nine mil of quarter strength ringer solution. This gives us a one in ten dilution. We shape the solution thoroughly before transferring one mil of it to each of these five sterile test tubes. These tubes contain five mil of A1 medium and an inverted Durham tube. We flame the test tube and transfer the solution using a fresh sterile one mil pipette. Using the same pipette, we repeat the procedure for the other four test tubes. We now put all five test tubes into an incubator. The samples are incubated at 44 degrees C for 24 hours. At this temperature, only faecal coliform bacteria produce gas from the lactose in the A1 medium. And some of this gas becomes trapped in the Durham tube. After incubation, we examine the tubes to see which have produced gas. We count the number of positive tubes in this case there are three. Then, using this table, we can determine the most probable number of faecal coliforms per 100 mil of sample. So in this example, the NPN is 910. For unrestricted irrigation, there should be no more than 1,000 faecal coliform bacteria per 100 mil. So, in this case, the treated wastewater is safe to use for the irrigation of any crop. We hope that you've enjoyed watching this programme and have learnt sufficient about counting low numbers of both helminth eggs and faecal coliform bacteria to be confident enough to try out these procedures in your own laboratory. You will find all the details in this book we've written for the World Health Organisation and you can easily obtain it from the distributor of WHO publications in your own country.